I'm Ben Sawyer. I'm Bob Crawford. And this is The Road to Now. That's right. And The Road to Now took us up to Portland uh, not too long ago, where we did several interviews. And uh, after some speculation uh, and some intrigue, we managed to secure an interview with uh, an elusive individual by the name of Scott Avid. That's right. He's elusive, mysterious, and he lives in the bunk across from me on the bus. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that I wanted for people to see in having us, you and I having a conversation with Scott was um, I wanted people to see the guy that, that, I, that I speak with uh, every morning uh, having coffee with him. And he's just a lot of really interesting views on a lot of different topics. Yeah, and, and, you know, when you talked about doing this, one of the things that I said was, I think it's better if we don't, you know, to make sure that I'm there so we can mediate, medi- I could mediate it to make sure we, you know, pull things back in. Uh, I guess what I didn't think about is that I've known Scott since I was like 14 too. So it's really at times it became a conversation between the three of us. Sometimes it was a conversation between the two of you guys and I just love listening to you talk. So it's a unique episode. We talked about his background, what led him to music, about his understanding of the family. And it's, it's a, it's a fantastic story. And I just want to take a second here to, uh, to, to clarify some things because I feel like maybe I did fail in doing my job as a moderator uh, when I sat down to listen to the raw audio of this, uh, my wife listened with me, and she pointed out two really good things. My wife Kelly, who, by the way, is one of my one of the great people who keeps me keeps my feet to the ground, uh, she pointed out some some really good things. She said, "One, you didn't have Scott introduce himself, and you have everyone else introduce themselves. And you know, if you make the governor of Colorado introduce himself, maybe you should make Scott introduce himself." And, and so, I want to say uh, for those of you guys who don't know. I, uh, Scott is the, one of the, th- the three founding members of the Avid Brothers, along with uh, Bob, uh, of course, my co-host, and then his uh, Scott's brother, Seth, all great musicians. And so what's interesting about Scott, I've known him for years, and uh, he has a great background. He's a person that's always grateful. He's a person that's always wonderful to talk to. He's thoughtful, and he's also an artist. And a lot of people, I think, understand they know Scott from the music, but Getting to know Scott uh, and, and understanding that he is a very thoughtfully a part of his own family's history, uh, understanding that I think helps people understand Scott better. And I think his story is is so interesting to anyone, even if you're not a fan of the band. And understanding how he came to music and art is is, is a valuable thing in itself. Uh, secondly, one of the things that I think is worth saying is that this you know this podcast is called The Road to Now. And Bob and I, Scott is really one of those links that 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 have led us together, uh, you know, through Dane, who is the manager, Dane Honeycutt, who's one of my very closest friends, who is the manager for the Avid Brothers. Uh, you know, Bob and I creating this podcast. You know, Scott is a is an incredible link in that. And so this uh, podcast is a story of of Scott Avid himself, uh, who is a, as I said, a, a remarkable individual. But it's also a story of how this podcast started. It's literally a part of the history of, of Bob and I and, and of the podcast. So I hope you will enjoy this. And uh, my apologies for not getting to this sooner in the interview. But uh, I, I think you'll enjoy this interview a lot. So thank you for, for listening. Scott Avitt, welcome to The Road to Now. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Ben. It's great to have you. It's good to be here. We, we talked about having you on the show for a while. And um, at one point I was like, well, I could talk to Scott anytime. And Ben brought up the point, well, you know, you guys would be like two old friends talking and we, we probably wouldn't get a real conversation out of it. It would just be like kind of like chums and it might be boring for everybody. Yeah. And so I figured I would throw myself in here who's known Scott since uh, I was 14 <laughs> to uh, to make this more you know formal. <laughs> <Cut off Right. laughs> I don't know. I just figure having somebody outside. You guys live in a van together most of the time, right? Yeah. Like, well, uh, it's, country. A, it's a big van. It's it a was beautiful like, van. If you guys are talking, it'll be just like two old friends talking. And, you know, I think I'll just make it three. <laughs> <laughs> I could come in there and make it a little bit awkward. That'd be great. Uh, just hang out in the, in the hotel. Yeah. It, you know, for our listeners who don't know, Ben and Scott grew up together. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, we played soccer together in high school. Uh, and uh, by that, I mean I watched Scott play from the bench. Uh, he was very good and very fast. We go way back. We're from the same place, Ben and I are, um, literally. Yeah, we went, we went to church together. Mm-hmm. When I first moved to Mount Pleasant Methodist in middle school. Yep. Scott, you've done so many interviews over the years, and a lot of people know so much about your work with the Avett brothers and, and our, our career, but I think 
there are a lot of things about your life and your mind that a lot of people um, aren't aware of that I think are endlessly fascinating. And Great. one of them, speaking of church, is your grandfather, Clegg Avett. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Clegg? Uh, yeah, Clegg was uh, a Methodist minister in the Piedmont and Western uh, parts of North Carolina from the 40s through the 70s. Um, Clegg David actually preached at Mount Pleasant Methodist uh, wow. in the 40s, I believe. And Clegg was um, a progressive spiritual intellect, um, especially in comparison to his surroundings of, of Southeast United States in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, uh, which, which is something that I learned uh, as I, I read about Clegg and read uh, Clegg, well, or excuse me, read Clegg's work. Um, I mean, that's ultimately, you know, he was a Methodist minister uh, in North Carolina. Right, but I, I, I remember speaking to you about this a few years ago as you were going through this, uh, learning about his sermons. And he was somebody who, I think if, if people think of the image of, uh, you know, uh, someone who preaches in the mid-20th century in North Carolina, they're probably thinking uh, something very differently than what your grandfather was. He, he, he read Tolstoy, right? He read, he read Gandhi as well, right? Yep, he preached Gandhi. Uh, there's a sermon that I have uh, in, about Gandhi, him talking about, uh, you know, read these people, follow these people, listen to these people. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King, he was a champion of Martin Luther King's cause uh, as well, and that was not super popular among white Southerners at a certain time, you know. Uh, so, yeah, he was a progressive in that way, very much, very much a very loving man. Uh, it, it, in fact, reading his work is, uh, was and has been and, and continues to be life-changing for me. Um, it obviously, just what we said, led me to read Gandhi's autobiography, which led me to Tolstoy, which in his autobiography he talks about how Christianity was, uh, was a religion that he could never uh, get with, that he could never um, sympathize with or be a part of until he met Leo Tolstoy and, and understood his definition of Christianity and his brand of Christianity, if you will. Uh, so once, once into Tolstoy, where we all, we have some connecting, uh, I guess some lines cross right. and, and a line here with uh, your Russian studies. Um, you know, there's obviously Tolstoy was so brilliant. There's just a, a depth of work from him that goes, goes deep. Yeah. And once again, I think this is like, for, for me anyway, as someone who's from the South uh, and small town, uh, a lot of times people have conceptions of what, if you, if you evoke an image, they have an idea of what that is. And I think that your grandfather is a great example of how, if you look deeper, you find that people are complex and that people have, have, have you know, deeper intellects than sometimes people Absolutely. get credit for. Right, right. Um, I think about that a lot because I still live in small town, North Carolina, and um, we have assumptions and preconceived notions about people all over the country, all over the world, really. Yeah. And I'm, I'm constantly proven wrong and surprised uh, by what I, what I learned and the intelligence of, of people in small town America. Uh, yeah. I guess in what we call the rural areas. Yeah. Most people have something to offer if you listen to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thinking about your grandfather, an element to the songs that, that you and Seth write, um, lyrically, that uh, that kind of glides over the top of of religion in some ways. Mm-hmm. You know, you grew up knowing what Clegg did for a living. Is any of this conscious? So n- none of that was conscious as far as when we were writing love songs or just uh, personal songs about pain or just life experiences for us. Uh, when we were younger or when I was younger, I felt like everything that was happening to me was just happening to me, and it never happened to anybody else yeah. ever. And I was, as a as a child growing up, seeing Clegg's book uh, and hearing about him. I didn't I didn't really care to hear about it. I didn't. I wanted to challenge it. I didn't want to believe that there was an alignment that I would ever have to be uh, uh, part of with uh, my spiritual beliefs and religion. And Clegg kind of was 
just in that group of things, I was like, well, you know, religion is dangerous, and I, uh, I don't want any part of that. Uh, as I read what Clegg had to say, um, that opened the door for me, which is amazing to have a, a family member open that door to a, a world of understanding or the beginning of an attempt at understanding how uh, um, how I wasn't as special as I thought I was, you know, and then how you know what I was experiencing wasn't for the first time, and that there were. Uh, um, solutions to some of these questions that I felt like were only mine that I, I had to figure out by myself that these mystic <laughs> that these mystic questions had been asked by Clegg they'd been asked by Gandhi they'd been asked by Tolstoy right. and then they'd been asked by everyone else that, that had lived at some point in some way however far they got and uh, so as we grow and, and keep writing it's harder to 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 be like you're saying Bob like we understand the power in, in writing in broad in a broad fashion and sometimes in a vague fashion, but it's harder to do that the older you get as you center in on um, what your life has offered to you, or I can only, I shouldn't say you, as what I center into what my life has been to me and what it's, uh, what it's guided me towards um, being something more specific. And when, you, when you're led to someone like Tolstoy who's explaining something like Christianity in a way that is not harmful, then you, you start realizing there's other people that have asked these questions and had these conflicts and come up with, with solutions for them that are uh, they're, they're actual, they're real. Now, Clegg was your, is your father's father. Mm -hmm. um, your mother's father had a different profession than yeah. Clegg. Yeah, he Tell was a one-star general in World War II, uh, Korea, and Vietnam. Um, actually served, I don't know how... He was connected to General Patton, but but served within that network. I mean, amazing stories about him. Uh, yeah. So if you're if you're getting into Gandhi or Tolstoy, <laughs> and then you're then this other great man that's so amazing and respectable, and, and also described as gentle to his family, yeah. who was also you know like my my grandfather Clegg was a gentle man, gen like soft spoken, very brilliant. Then this this general who had been in warfare, you know much warfare also known as a very gentle soft-spoken you know light-handed man and it was a so, grandpa bill uh, uh william william gleason okay mm -hmm. any stories that come to mind that you could share well he he passed away before uh before i was born a year before i was born um i don't have a i don't know a whole lot of stories about the wars he was in because he didn't share them with his family as much although no one ever uh presented him as as he never came off as damaged in any way as far as by what he had seen right. he did not bring that upon the family in any way you know it was it was uh my grandmother i i think picked up uh carried the torch after he had passed there was a belief in in the united states and their service and there, they didn't they didn't question that it would seem like they were they were very certain in their duty and their debt to, or what they what they had been given by the United States and the the, uh, the service that they had performed. Um, it seems so much clearer, yeah, than it does than it feels now. Yeah, and it just seems like uh, you know, it's a lot of folks. You go off and you do that duty, and it is. I mean, we all live in a world that is way better because they they made that sacrifice for us. And, and for them, I'm sure it was, we did this great thing and we're back and we've lived through that and we're ready for things to get back to normal. Yeah. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure, if, you know, you know how it is. You go off and you do things in your life and you come back and they're not even that exciting. But if when I go off and travel, I come back home. A lot of times I just want to sit and hang out with my family. You know, I can imagine if I'd done something that severe. Absolutely. So you have these two grandfathers who... In, in some ways, on the face level, seem very, very, uh, you know, different. But in, in terms of their, their, the way they were described to you and the way you understand them, they were gentle. Uh, and you came across, as you said, uh, your grandfather Clegg's sermons later on in your life. Mm -hmm. How did that change the way you understand yourself? Because, you know, we all have a narrative we tell, you know, ourselves, a story in, in which things fit. And as we learn more about ourselves and as what matters changes, that narrative changes. Mm -hmm. So can you think of ways that like understanding this connection to this uh, remarkable figure changed the way you think about yourself? Uh, remarkable figure as far as Clegg right. or, or and both your promote, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I, I can. I can only speak sort of in, in present term, like where I am now with right. that with that path that it yeah. put me on, and it's made me mm, want to lessen the the. Uh, let me see how do I how do I word this to become myself the the proper self i'm i'm trying to remove myself from you know from my equation for example um when i'm in a situation where it's cold rather than trying to make it warm accept that i'm going to be cold uh remove my need that myself is calling for uh and be accepting of of what is and uh that is that just that letting go um in spiritual terms that is the giving of myself to god and trusting that in giving myself to god that uh then i then i finally then i am becoming my true self and uh that is only through god that that can happen that's a complex thing that's something that i'm only tiptoeing into right now right. but that the start of it is when I was realizing how gentle and how soft-spoken and how um, modest Clegg was and then I look at what I do and I look you know turn the mirror on myself and I'm screaming on stage at people and I'm going okay what have I done that's me you know right, that's how people right, identify right. <laughs> yeah um and is it? And uh, so now there's this quote unquote cross to bear that I have built yeah. for myself that is not necessarily <laughs> me. Now I'm not the best judge. So yeah. then I have to say, well, what am I to other folks? But not to get just like to start doing circles and get, right. you know, we could just yeah. turn it inside out. But, uh, but I think a, a, a quieter sense of being is where it's leading me towards, which is eventually letting go of self as as much as, as possible. Yeah, and I think that, at least personally, having a son now, it, it's strange. I was telling somebody the other day that you suddenly cease to be the product of all of humanity and you are both product and producer of. Yeah. And that puts you in a much different relationship to humanity and you start thinking about the trajectory, at least I do anymore, my own family history, where did I come from? Because at some point, you know, when you're when you're the end of everything, you know, it gives you a very, like you said, a very one dimensional perspective on things. I mean, but then when you're in the middle, you know, it's a it, it's it's a really it changes the way I think you I think of myself anyway. And you and I have talked a great length about Tommy Jarrell or or um, even Mike Seeger and John Hartford and just like it doesn't have to be North Carolina old time music, but but we know that there were great fiddle players in Georgia in the twenties. There were great fiddle players in North Carolina. It was very regional. What is the appeal? Why is old time music yeah. so important? This is not off subject or it doesn't really change the subject we were on at all. If I'm, if I'm thinking in line here, because I referenced something John Harford said where, you know, he wrote some amazing songs, very thought evoking uh, songs when he wasn't doing that. And it, he was asked about that. He mentioned uh, in, in an interview that I, I read once, that uh, it was like swinging a hammer, like learning to play these old time songs was much more akin to this, like sort of like a blue collar lifestyle of, of a craft. And it was not about inventing something that would, you know, woe people or necessarily change the world or anything, but it was more like going to work and, and a craft. And I think that mechanical relationship between people and craft alone, with, without the history of it, is super important to a, a, a type of music like old time music. Now that's it, it's other types of music too apply to that for sure. Um, as far as old time music is a historical uh, element or the historical element to old time music, I mean, I, I don't I, I don't think I could even s say enough about how important that is as far as carrying on that tradition when it when it marks so many things like pre war and. Uh, um, how people celebrated life before computers and cell phones and what they did before video games you know that I think that was what people were doing um, but the 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 root of old time music is like 
it kind of is void of all that stuff at any given time and it's just two guys if it's fiddle and banjo just wanting to sit down and play uh the song doesn't even have to be melodically uh a proper historical tune it could be just something that two people are playing and there's an essence to it and a, a spirit to old time which is just just performing a repetitive melody together yeah, i think it's amazing that a lot of the artists that we really regard like tommy Jarrell, for example he worked for the highway department yeah for for his whole career yeah speaking on like the celebrating life like it, that was a it was an enjoyment thing it wasn't a career like fiddle wasn't looked at it like for him it's no. something that he was gonna go out and make a living doing it was it was something he just he just loved doing and he's the, the, the Jimi hendrix of old time yeah <laughs> no, hands down it's amazing and I think also something about preserving history, I mean, preserving music as well, as a historian, I should say, is that a lot of these, you know, when, when songs come about and they're repeated over time, uh, then they become themselves primary sources. I mean, the words that people use, the, the language, the music itself, and the stories they tell are valuable in that sense as well. So when you're playing, you know, when, you, when you're playing an old type of music and, and you're bringing in something new, essentially what you're doing is you're adding on, you're, you're, you're adding to that historic trajectory mm -hmm. uh, musically. So a big part of your narrative, Scott, is your love of art. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I think people are aware of, of posters you've done in the past and, and our, our album covers most recently that you and Cracker Farm collaborated on for True Sadness. Where did that start? Where did that start? I have no idea. I really don't know. I don't think it was something that was... I mean, it started in childhood, obviously. But I think, I think it's more about how was that... Uh, fostered. That's really what it's about. Because I think it started in you and you and you and every. I think everyone starts. Like we see our children. They're all. They're all willing to try to make something, and they all seem to like that. Some more than others. And if if those who are more than others are, and the, most of those are not, it's not fostered in them. Um, for us, uh, we were. I don't know. We were allowed to let our imagination. Run. Well, so it's something your your parents nurtured even yeah, passively. The, okay. Yeah, it was passively, no doubt about it. But it, it was like an old time approach as far as the working day is over and yeah, you know, have at it. This is great. Let's talk about it. Let's 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 draw at the table. Let's put on a show for mom and dad. You know, whatever. They just that wasn't that wasn't just silly fun and games. It's something that we don't have time for. It was always something that we seem to have time for. So. But it was never talked about as a career thing. Did did either your parents draw? Our our dad did, yeah, absolutely. He he did. He drew a lot for us, and he painted when he was younger. So I think that was you know you you looked at that and you thought, well, dad paints, dad draws, even though he might not have for many years. <laughs> but uh, he did draw with us a lot. And, um, and what what was what were his drawings like? Cartoons. Like Seth draws a lot of cartoons, like characters and. Uh, dad, we we both watched Dad do that. I'm I'm not as good at doing characters. Uh, I'm more drawing from life. Uh, my characters are terrible. Seth uh, and Dad both have this great knack for it. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, that's directly from just. I mean, we would go to church and we would sit in church and draw the characters in church. And Dad was always like, "Oh, you know, don't take the sermon too seriously. Let's just we're going to <laughs> to." Uh, we need to do, we because we need to go to church. That's why we're here. Okay, so we would go to church, and he would draw, just slide over a drawing of, of I don't know the the senior citizen sitting in front of us, and we would laugh. And <laughs> my mom would get so upset, and then we draw another one. Some of them were really great. That's um, so much better than me. I just used to draw tanks and uh, and jet planes attacking the picture of the church on the front of our bulletin, which I think was probably far more directly sacrilegious. <laughs> <laughs> so you were drawing in, even in grade school, like things like that? Yeah, early on, like first grade, I used to sit with a, a friend, and I've been doing this with my son, Max, but we would draw, and this is like you, Ben, I would draw, like on a piece of paper, I would draw a cliff on one side and a cliff on the other. And it would come down to a valley. It might be filled with water. It might just be a valley. And it was a profile. And I would draw. We might. We would narr narrate it. So I would say, okay, here's a tunnel. And this guy is the, the general over here, the boss. And over here is this guy. And then we would draw an airplane. And then there one guy has got a gun. And it would be basically opposing sides. <laughs> it wasn't so much about the opposition and the right. war of it, but it was about telling a story yeah. of contrast. <laughs> And we would draw until the paper was filled with bullets. 
sea monsters, <laughs> tanks driving down into the valley, boats. Like in the pe- the pages would be filled with these stories. That was and and my friend Mark would watch and he'd say, "Oh, they do this." And, he would he would do this little thing. Like, he would just get so excited, and we would just get. He was commanding the forces. We loved it. It was it was, a, and I would I don't know. We would both narrate him. We did lots of those, and so I've been doing it with my son now because it, it uh, I don't know. It was a visualizing thing. It's still the way. I, th- I mean, I still think that way. I think about songs that way. I think. Um, yeah. So in terms of the art that you do, and I've seen it, and if uh, if our listeners haven't seen Scott's art, it's it's incredible. Do you, it's, don't you have a website? Yeah, I do. The website is in in disrepair right now, I, I, but it, you can go to it. Yeah, it's scottavit.com. It's 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 great. Uh, w- when you look back at the influences, not just your life influences, but when you look at the artists whose work inspired you, uh, who 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 are they and, and why? The first artist that I really when I started painting, which wasn't until. I, I did paint in uh, my senior year in high school, maybe one or two paintings in an art class, but that was the first art class I took, formal class. In college, I, I started painting, I guess, 98. Um, and the first painter that I was drawn to completely, just in love with, was Degas, um, uh, for whatever reason. Um, Degas, Manet, some of the Impressionists that that were figurative, uh, primarily, um, and then the next were some more uh, contemporary painter Wayne Tebow, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation the pronunciation of the name there, but uh, and then Caravaggio has has moved me for years. God, you know, yeah, just insane. following him. And I mean, uh, I'm careful to get into talking about a lot of artists because I uh, visually I know a lot. Like I, I I study it way more than I understand names and studying yeah. why they painted what they painted right, it's right. more about um the mechanics of painting and application of paint when i'm looking at uh work and i try not to get caught up with looking at too much work when i really want to be making well like i have the need to make work and um there's a balance there and my balance for looking at work is much uh the the, the ratio is much less of looking at others work um versus me Get in the studio and just going to work. So where does that come from? Where's that need? I mean, what, what, and I'm not talking about now, now it's, now it's habit, right? Mm-hmm. Now the need has become the thing you do. Yeah. And, uh, and then t- to a great extent, it's your, it's your job. Mm-hmm. So it's justified. Mm-hmm. But where, where did you first notice that need? Was it just all fun at first where you just, man, you're like I just love being in the studio working on this stuff. I don't even know why. I just I just love it. Mm-hmm. Or was it um was there something else driving it? Yeah. Well, when it comes to like, visual, is so different than music. For music, that was always um, an opportunity to entertain people and get in front of people, which I I really enjoyed the attention. You know, I got to say, you know, in the beginning stages, I just wanted the attention. I wanted to, a chance to to just move in front of people for and some with painting there's been times where I really wanted people to see that I was good at something and ability Um, but beyond that since I haven't shown since 2012 and before that it was several years I uh, regardless I have a plan or a deadline or a show to, to prepare for I can't stop and I don't I wish I had a way to articulate why I go to work but I just I just try to I mean, I just do. I just go to work. I, I know when I need to, but I don't know why. Uh, I'm that's pathetic. I really need to to learn how to articulate it. It's. I think, but um, I mean, what you're getting at is there's something innate that we have. This is this is attachment to what we create, and even if it's not something that we show everybody. I mean, I know that like, I myself as a historian, like if I go a couple of days without reading something or digging into some sources mm-hmm. or, or coming up with a question and then going to answer it. I begin to doubt myself. Mm-hmm. I begin to wonder who I am, and it's not it's not good for me or for anybody I'm with. It's, I think it speaks to like, and I don't know where it comes from, right? It's, a, it's like a self, hey, well, Scott, you're not pathetic. Yeah, but let's, it, let's yeah. clarify here. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, but. Um, but there, I think that there's this human, that you can connect this to religion or um, asking questions of existence, and then art, I think the drive to either, you know, do your job or, or, um, or create art or be uh you know 
if the drive to make money, the drive to build a hat, like I think that, you know, what, what gives us our drives? No, I know. And, and going back to what we're talking about, Bob and I talk about this a lot. We, I, I don't know if we ever make a whole lot of sense, but we talk about it a lot and the removal of, of self with, within yourself. There's such a relief to that. You know, whenever you let go of a project and all of a sudden the space and time is created and you still feel good and you realize I'm never going to be good enough, you know, no matter what I make. I've never made a painting that um, several months later I look back on it and it looked it looked still professional to me. Like once I'm past it, then I look back and go, you know, they don't really serve anything beyond that that last, you know, that finished moment. And then I need more. I need more. I, I need think that's more. reflected in, in our songs as far as the way we play them live, how they're constantly getting mm-hmm. getting makeovers. They're mm-hmm. not we just finished a record and playing these songs live, they're they're changing immediately. Yep. Absolutely. Immediately. And I say like with me as a as a writer and as a, as as a historian, I go back and forth where like there are some days where I look back at something I wrote two years ago and I go, What is that garbage? And then some days I look back and go how was I that good then? Yeah, yeah. I've lost something. Yeah. And so it's like never, never, no matter what, I, what it is when I look back at that stuff, there's something to find that's a deficiency. Mm-hmm. So where's the, when, did you, when you went to college, did you go as an art major? I went as an art major first, but then I dropped out after the first year because I felt like they were, you know, I, I, classic me. I was like, they can't tell me what's right in art. There's no right or wrong in art. And so I got mad and quit. And uh, well, what did you do? What did you do after I that? Ended up going into communications. Well, I went from art to zoology. Began flunking science classes, and then in, a, uh, in an attempt to salvage the credits that I had, <laughs> I went into communications and got a, a degree in radio broadcasting with a minor in art. And as I was finishing the, the performance radio broadcasting degree, my art professor, Leland Wall, and a painter said, you were born to do this, you need to stay in school. And I said, Leland, I'm, I'm so tired, I gotta get out, I'm 20, what did I say, I'm 21 years old. Man, that's, <laughs> that is old. Yeah, that's, what I, that's how <laughs> that's I felt. Old. He said, Scott, in 10 years, you're, this, we're talking about another year and a half of your life. Yeah. This is seriously. And then he, he told me, eventually he said, you need to quit. You need to quit the music. He said it's, it's, he even played our music early in class. Like he would play cassette tapes that Seth and I had made. <laughs> he was a music, he loves music. Leland, Leland loves music and is a, is a uh, published writer. But he said, you need to, to quit the music you were born to paint. You need to go to graduate school and then you need to move to New York. That's it. Done deal. Don't, <laughs> he was like, that's what you need to do. And uh, even though I didn't do it, Leland was right. I mean, it was a it was a valid path for me. It would have been a good path for me. Uh, you you applied to graduate school at one time. I did. Right? I was in. I was yeah. going to Florida to graduate school and uh, deferred it twice. And eventually, the the uh, what is it the admissions admissions that's it admissions was like, like look <laughs> we got your name you're in <laughs> sounds like you know what you're doing now you just if you ever decide to come to school call us and so. But they were aware of us as a band at that point. We were starting to, to I guess, take off. <laughs> so it was, the, it was the the performance of the band and doing well and better and better that led you to, to not go and not some other doubts. Yeah, yeah, no doubts. No, I mean, I, I felt I felt like I just I had options. It's good. It's a good yeah, feeling. It feels good. And my dad always said, you go to college so you have options. That's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, you'll learn, but you want you want to do that to have options. That's you're going to need to do that in this world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. In college, did, did you ever have a, you know, kind of have a moment of doubt? You kind of, I think it's hard being in college because you're at a certain age and you've got all this newfound freedom and uh, you're not quite mature enough to handle it really. And often we get ourselves in trouble. Um, did you ever have kind of like a, a moment where you thought like maybe college isn't for me? Yeah, I, I, I decided to quit college, and I had been offered a job at a landscaping company to be a foreman on a crew, and it was a great-paying job, and it, it looked like a dream job to me because I always said if I didn't do something artistically, I was going to do something uh, manual labor-wise, uh, carpentry or landscaping or something like that, and uh, to me that looked good. So I took the job, and then two weeks later I, I changed my mind. 
and said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to apply myself. And that's really sort of the turning point where I did. So the landscaping job was really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of ma- manual labor, uh, you have gotten the, well, you, I want to say you just got in, got into farming now. That's not mm-hmm. true. Your father kind of kept a, ho- a hobby farm your whole life. Yeah, yeah. We so all, you, yeah. You've been around farming your whole life. Yeah. To one ex- to to some extent. It never made any money, but it was a farm. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> you're you're doing that now yourself. Yeah. Well, I'm administering it. <laughs> so uh, administrator. But talk a little bit about what inspired you to kind of get more serious about it. Sure. Well, this is the beginning stages of of. I guess being someone that owns more than two or three acres, I feel obligated to do something good with it. And I think that's a pro I mean, doing something good with land is certainly a process, uh, something that takes many years to do. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in as close to, uh, a natural lifestyle as I can live, I think is, or, my, or I can provide for my family is, is the way to go. So, uh, if you're going to try to do that, I guess providing for yourself is, uh, is a good, is a good way to start. So that, that sort of dr- has been driving us to, to see if we can feed ourselves. And, uh, I think the next step would be let our property be some sort of example for some others, uh, maybe, um, but I think mo- mostly just having property, I'm obligated to let it do something that's that's great and also in harmony with uh, with the history of the property or or the community. Talk a little bit about the Lomax farm in in Concord. Yep, uh, Elma C. Lomax Incubator Farm is a farm that uh, it's a farm school in Cabarrus County, North Carolina, that teaches their their mission is to teach young farmers uh, organic farming. Uh, they in their statement their mission statement they say that i believe it's 55 or 59 years old is the average age of the farmer in in the united states and their mission is to bring young farmers to the to the fold and um and train them in in responsible ways uh i personally think there's a future in local farming across the board um we talk a lot about food we talk a lot about farming we understand some of the dangers, or we think we, we feel like we understand some of the dangers of, of how do you feed all the people that need to be fed with local farming. But I think if there's a lot of local farming, then it, you, you have the potential of something operating um, as it should. So Lomax is part of the, the growth of that, of that uh, mentality. Uh, it's an amazing place, amazing place. You can, you, I guess you're assigned an acre or so and you you learn how to farm whatever it is that you're looking to farm uh in our local community it's a it's a it's an amazing resource um i think it's cabarrus county working as it should i think it's for its for the farmland that's in cabarrus county just like many many counties in the united states i would imagine have similar opportunities uh it's something that i feel like is is important to help in any way i could financially or or uh just just getting the word out scott avitt thank you (laughs) thanks for having me guys we'll continue this (laughs) well thank you for joining us on the road to now please be sure and find us on facebook follow us on twitter at road underscore two underscore now or visit our website the road to now.com and thank you so much for all the great comments and the ratings on itunes It really helps to get the word out about the show. We really appreciate it. Until next time, for Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care.